This is from a 2023 Fortune magazine article. 57% of Americans cannot afford a $1,000 emergency expense. Now read this statistic from Time magazine. 51% of Americans earning over six figures a year are living paycheck to paycheck. That means if your car breaks down, if you have to pay for a funeral expense, or if your wife wants to go on a vacation, the majority of Americans, whether you're earning $40,000 a year or $140,000 a year, have to go into debt to fund this expense. Now, making your first $100,000 of wealth is so difficult because that means you have to do three things. Number one, you have to actually earn the money. Number two, you can't spend all of that money. And then number three, you have to learn what to actually do with that money. And there are five main habits and things that are holding so many people back from ever achieving any sort of wealth, let alone the first $100,000 worth of wealth that I want to go over. And then I want to go over what you should do instead. That way you can actually start living the life that you want with the wealth that you want. Now, of course, money isn't the only part of life, but today I'm talking about the financial part of money. And the first thing that you have to understand is your mindset. If you want to change your life over the next 12 months, the first thing that you have to work on is your mindset. And this is one of those things that people hate talking about because most people are so oblivious to this. But if you do not have the right mindset, it is going to be impossible for you to ever ever, ever achieve any sort of real financial wealth. And when I say mindset, what I mean by that is now the way you look at money, the way you look at success, the way you look at successful people. Because most of us have this limited, scarcity, hating mindset. We hate people who are successful. We have this limited mindset that if you're successful, I can't be successful. We're always counting other people's pennies. We're not worried about what we're doing. And we're always worried about what other people think. But if that's the way you think, if your mindset is broke, it is going to be impossible for you to ever achieve any sort of wealth. And this is so hard because many of us, and I get this because I've been there, many of us have it ingrained in us that when we're growing up, we keep hearing, oh, we can't afford that. And so you think, I can't afford that. And then you tell your kids, we can't afford that for nice things that you might want to have. You tell yourself that rich people are bad or they must have done something bad in order to have the nice car, in order to have the nice home, that they must have this like shady side to them. Or we start to think, oh, if you're rich, I can't be rich. We have this jealousy complex where and people don't want to say it, but when you see somebody else who's successful, the first thing you want to do is find the excuses as to how they got there. You come up with they had rich parents, they had this given to them, they had that given to them, anything except the fact that they might have worked hard, they might have done something, they might have taken a risk, they might have sacrificed something in order to get to where they are. And this is where now, if you want to become successful, instead of looking at the luck, because yeah, of course, there's an element of luck to it. Nobody gets there all by themselves. I mean, it takes effort, it takes risk, it takes skill, but of course, luck with it. And the harder you work and the more effort you put in, the luckier you're going to be. This is kind of how it works. But without understanding the effort, without understanding the risk, without understanding the sacrifice, you were never going to become successful yourself. And then if you keep hating, if you keep blaming, it is never going to be possible for you. If you keep saying that I cannot be successful because of who the president is, if you can't be successful because of the way that I look, if I can't become successful because of where I grew up, if I can't become successful because of who my parents are, if I can't become successful because of the way I was raised, I can't become successful because of who my spouse is, it is going to be impossible because you've already built that fence. You've already built that barrier saying that you cannot become successful. How do you expect to do it if you tell yourself you're not smart enough, if you're not successful enough, if you're not good looking enough, if you're not cool enough, if you don't have whatever it takes to go out and do it? If you want to do something, you have to almost become stupid. And the reason why I say stupid is because that's what I called myself when I was going through my entrepreneurial journey. Everybody told me that somebody like me, who didn't have any business experience, who didn't know any business people, didn't have any entrepreneurial experience, didn't know anything about money, who my, none of, no one in my family is an investor. No one in my family is an entrepreneur. I grew up being told that I need to become a doctor. I studied hard in school, and the only thing that I knew was studying and medicine. That was it. I don't know anything about money management, financial education, entrepreneurship. This was a completely foreign world, and everybody, I'm talking about my family, I'm talking about my friends, Everyone that was close to me kept telling me that I was throwing the sacrifices that my parents made away 
by trying to do something dumb and being an entrepreneur. Now, what I didn't know was all the risks that I would have to take, all the hard work that I was going to have to put in, all the time that I was going to have to sacrifice, and all the stress that comes with being an entrepreneur. If I knew all that going in, maybe I wouldn't have done it, but I was stupid. I was ignorant. And I just wanted to do something different because that was really important to me. Not because I wanted to prove it to somebody else, although I did really want to prove the world wrong. But I did it because that was something that was important to me. And I was willing to do whatever it took. And that's why I went that route. And for me, my mindset was, I'm just working on today. I'm just working on making the next dollar. I'm just working on trying to figure out the next thing. It wasn't trying to get to necessarily a destination more than like, this is what I want to do and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And I knew that I was going to do something big. I just didn't know when or how or what. And I had this like dumb belief. I don't know where it came from, but I had this dumb belief that I knew that I was going to do it and nothing was going to stop me. I kept reading books. I kept listening to audiobooks. I kept learning from people because I didn't have access to people in my network. I tried to go out and find people. And you have to just have this dumb belief that you can do something, that you can earn more money, that you can become successful, that you can have the things that you want. Because without that belief, it is going to be completely impossible. And this is where now you have to start with that mindset and shift your mindset to understanding that there's an abundance of money out there. The Federal Reserve Bank is printing trillions and trillions of dollars. There's a lot of money in the world. All you need is a teeny tiny little piece of that if you want to become extremely financially successful. It's just a small little sliver of it, which means... You have to figure out how can you attract that money? How can you get somebody else to give you money in exchange for something that you're offering? What value can you provide? Can you create something? Can you build something? Can you teach something? Can you offer something? What is this value that you can provide that somebody else is willing to give you their money for? Or somebody's going to be willing to give you their time for? Or somebody's going to be willing to give you their attention for? Once you have that, Making the money is the easy part, but you have to be able to grasp that value and that attention. And you can't do that unless you believe it's possible. So sometimes you got to be a little bit stupid. That way you can actually believe that somebody like you can do it. Not saying it's not possible, but you got to believe that you can do it before anybody else is going to believe that you can do it. The second thing that holds so many people, the majority of Americans from ever achieving any sort of financial wealth ever, let alone in the next 12 months, is a lifestyle. I mean, we talked about how 51% of six-figure earners are living paycheck to paycheck. Well, also a third of people making $250,000 a year are living paycheck to paycheck, which means it's not an income problem. Most people assume that the reason why I can't build any wealth, the reason why I can't save money, the reason why I can't invest money is because I'm not making any money. I'm not making enough money. And so when you ask the majority of people, what would fix their financial problems right now? They say, making more money. If I just made an extra $10,000 a year, all my financial problems will be solved. If I made an extra 50 grand a year, oh my God, I'd be living so free. But what ends up happening statistically is when somebody makes more money, their lifestyle inflates. You get a new raise, you get a new car, you get a big bonus, you go on a nice vacation. It's one of those things where we keep thinking that the success is at the end of this next journey. As soon as I get to this next chapter, I make this new income. Now, all of a sudden, all my financial problems will go away. But you keep digging yourself into a bigger financial hole because what happens to so many people is anytime you make more money, you inflate your lifestyle. And the quickest way, the quickest way for you to increase your wealth is next time you get a raise, next time you get a bonus, You don't inflate your lifestyle. You make more money without inflating your lifestyle. That way you have more money to invest. If you really want to become successful, and I'm talking about really successful, is you got to go through what I call the decade of sacrifice. And this decade of sacrifice is you live small and you're working to earn more money. And then you have this margin with your income. Now, what you're doing with this margin is you're not just saving it. Obviously, you want to have some savings, but you want to take this money and now you want to put this money to work. You want to invest this money. If you put in a solid decade of sacrifice of you hustling, of you living small, of you trying to make more money, I guarantee you, you are going to surprise yourself at how much wealth you can build. I don't care how much money you're making. Obviously, you want to work to earn more money. The more money you earn, the more potential you have to make more wealth, but If you start doing this and you really work to live small, cut out the expenses while you're working to earn more money, 
and you take that money that you're not spending and you invest it, you are going to surprise yourself and the world at how free you're going to be. And everybody is going to be looking at you like, how did you do it? Because then you're going to have the opportunity to sleep a whole lot easier, go on nicer vacations, drive a nicer car, have the better things without worrying about the price because you went through that sacrifice that most people are not willing to do. If you want to do what the majority of people are not doing, you can't keep doing what the majority of people do. And the third thing that holds so many people back from ever achieving any sort of wealth is debt, consumer debt. What is debt? Debt is when you take tomorrow's earnings and you spend it today. And then you have to pay that money back plus interest. So when you go out and you borrow $50,000 to buy a car, that means you're taking this year's, next year's, the years after that, and the year after that's income, and you're spending it right now. And the price that you pay to spend your future income today is interest. Now, if you use that $50,000 to go out and buy something that's going to make you money, no big deal, because now you can use the income from this thing that you bought to pay back the debt as long as you do it strategically. But now when you go into debt $50,000 to buy a car, that means you're spending this year's, next year's, the year after that, maybe even the year after that, maybe even the year after that's income today, and you spend it to buy a car, which is dropping in value. So now you're spending next year's, the year after that's income today to buy something that's dropping in value, and then you have to pay interest on top of that. So now when you're using debt to buy something, that means you're using next year's income to buy something today that's losing you money. And this is where now we live in a consumerism culture. We live in a culture where it's completely normal to buy things that you can't afford with money that you don't have thanks to the help of credit cards and lines of credit. Now, I only use a credit card. I love using my credit card because I get cash back. I get perks. I get rewards. I get fraud protection. I get a bunch of things on my credit card but I also have never paid a penny in interest to my credit card company. If you maintain a balance on your credit card, you are using your credit card wrong and you should never use a credit card to buy things that you cannot afford. I use my credit card as a medium of transaction. Instead of me using a debit card or paying with cash, I use a credit card. And because I use a credit card instead of a debit card, I get cash back. I get perks. I get rewards. I get flight upgrades, I get car upgrades, I get hotel upgrades for doing nothing except using my credit card to make the regular purchases that I would normally do. I don't go out and buy something just because I want a credit card perk. I go out and buy something because I want to buy it or because I need it. Then instead of me going into my bank account and pulling out physical cash, I just swipe with my credit card and then I pay off the entire balance every month without ever being late. And then because I do that, I get free rewards. If you are paying interest on your credit card, if you have a credit card balance, you are the person that's paying for everybody else's credit card points. And so right now, if you have a credit card balance, you got to stop spending on your credit card and you got to pay down the credit card ASAP because the interest rate on your credit card is skinning you alive financially. If you cannot control your spending, don't use a credit card. It is not worth the perks and the rewards. You have to first be able to control your spending. You have to know that you're never going to spend more because you're using a credit card instead of cash. And you have to just treat your credit card like a medium of exchange to pull money out of your bank account. If you're buying things that you don't plan on buying normally, or if you're buying things that you cannot afford normally with your credit card, you're using your credit card the wrong way. And in that case, you need to cut up your credit card, get rid of your credit card, and pay down your credit card ASAP. But if you're using your credit card just like a medium of exchange, just to buy the things that you would normally buy, and then you pay it off in full every single month, then yeah, get your perks, get your rewards, get your flight upgrades, get your hotel upgrades, get your car upgrades. Why not? You're getting it as a reward because, well, you're using a tool that banks are offering. Right now, 35% of America has credit card debt, and nearly everybody has a car payment. It is so normal in our society to use the credit card as a free money line to go out and buy things, whatever we want, when we can't afford them. You should not be doing that. It's the same with your car. I kind of hinted at this just a minute ago. It is so normal, so normal to have a car payment. Well, let me tell you something. You don't need to have a car payment and you don't need to drive a brand new car. You don't even need to have the newest cars. If you want to build wealth, it is really not that complicated. Yeah, you could get into all the nitty gritties and all the details, but if you really want to build wealth, it comes down to a basic three-step formula. 
First, you ache, you make money. Second, you spend less than what you make. Third, you invest the difference. Then you can get into the nitty gritties of how do you earn more money? How do you spend less money? How do you invest the money? Do you invest it in stocks? Do you invest it in real estate? What's an expense ratio? What is a money manager? What, where are the different places that you can invest your money? But the biggest issue isn't that people are investing their money the wrong way or that they're saving their money the wrong way or that they're earning their money the wrong way. It's that they're not doing that thing to begin with. You're not earning money. You're not spending less than what you make or you're not investing your money. Once you do those three main things, then you can start getting into the nitty gritty. It's just like fitness. If you want to get in shape, you can get into all the details of what type of diet that you want, of how many calories you're going to eat, of how many macros that you're eating, of how many minutes you're spending on the treadmill, of what the incline is on the treadmill, of how much weight you're using or how many reps you're doing. When in reality, if you want to get in shape, okay, watch what you eat, work out more. And then you can get into all the nitty gritty, but you got to start with the basics. It's the same with money. When we talk about your car, this one triggers a lot of people and I get it. Look, I like nice cars. I have a lot of respect for luxury cars, fast cars, nice cars, exotic cars. I get it. Growing up, when I first started making money, before I had my <laughs> financial education, my money was essentially a direct deposit into my car. Anytime I made money, I upgraded my car. First thing I did was I upgraded the rims. I put on new aftermarket rims on my car. Then I put on tents on my car. Then I put on HIDs on my car. Then I put in subwoofers on my car. Then I upgraded the sound system on my car. I mean, I, I put a lot of money in cars. But then once I started to realize that my car was just a money pit, I started to learn about money. And if I wanted to build wealth, I had to put my money into something that was going to make me money. My car wasn't going to make me money. It was a complete shift for me. The first time I made a million dollars, in a year, I was driving a car that was beat down, broken, probably worth about $500. Today, I'm still driving that car that's worth about $500. It doesn't have a bumper on it today. I have employees that drive better cars than I do. Why? Because right now I'm working on building my wealth. I'm working on building my business. I'm working on building my investments. And so, yeah, you don't have to have a car payment. And it's very painful because that means you might have to downgrade from a BMW to a Toyota Camry, maybe a Toyota Corolla, buy it used with cash. If you went out and bought a new BMW, you might be paying $8,000 down to go and get the new $60,000 BMW. Take the eight grand that you were going to put down and go out and buy a nice Toyota or a nice Honda with cash and take the car payment that you're no longer spending and put that money directly into your investments. Take that ins expensive insurance payment that you're no longer spending, put that into your investments. Take that premium gas that you no longer have to buy, put that towards your savings. You have a lot of extra money now that you're going to save just because you no longer have a car payment because you don't have to have a car payment. It's a game because all of my friends have car payments too. And it's a cycle. I I every couple of years, it's the same thing. They work to pay down their car. As they pay down their car, they get toward the end of their car note. It's, oh, now I got to go get a new car because what am I going to do without a car payment? That's going to be really weird without a car payment. So now you work to pay down the car, you sell the car, you get a new car, and now you start the payment game all over again. It's so hard to get out of the trap once you get into it. But once you break it, you're going to feel a lot more freedom where you don't have to worry about making that payment every single month. And instead, that money is going to buy you assets and maybe it's stocks that pay you dividends. Now, every month, instead of buying a car payment, you're just buying more cash flow. You're buying this investment that's just paying you more money every quarter. And now every three months, you're just getting a bigger check. Why? Because instead of taking that money and putting it to your car payment, you're using that money to buy more dividends. Every three months, more money is coming right back at you. And before you know it, now these dividends are going to be growing to the point where, hmm, maybe you can buy a nicer car because you got more dividends coming at you. Because now instead of you going out and buying a car, you have assets that will buy your car for you. The fourth thing that I want you to work on is earning money. Because the reality is if you're making $20,000 a year, it's going to be very hard and take you a long time to build any sort of wealth. Because even if you're living very small, you're going to have a very small piece of money that's actually going to be invested, going to work to make you wealthy. And so now understanding when earning more money plays a bigger part in your life. Because yeah, if you don't know how to spend your money, it doesn't matter how much money you earn, you're going to be broke. That's why the majority of people who make six figures a year are also broke. It's not because they're not earning enough money. It's because they don't know what to do with their money. 
first thing you got to do is you got to learn what to do with your money. You got to know how to spend your money and you got to know how to invest your money. Now, once you do that, you built a system. You know how to live below your means. You know how to put your money to work. Now you just got to put more fuel on the fire. That means now you got to go out and earn more money. There's a lot of money in the world. There are trillions of dollars out there. Thanks, the Federal Reserve Bank, and this money is continually flowing into our economic system. All you need is a teeny tiny little piece of that economic pie. That way you can be rich or wealthy financially. And that means you got to find a way to earn more money. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. In the internet game, it's all about attention. You are watching this YouTube video. Because you're watching this YouTube video, I am getting paid. Okay? YouTube puts advertisements on these videos. I don't know which advertisements they put on. But because they put advertisements on their, these videos, they give me a portion of the advertisement dollars that they get. Now, I don't get a ton of money for the advertisement dollars that I get. I think we get like a penny or something per view. It's not a lot of money, but it's something. And it all goes to attention. For me, then I funnel people to Briefs Media, my newsletter company. I have a newsletter called Market Briefs, which is a free newsletter for investors. Every day we're breaking down what's happening with the financial news, with the stock market, the housing market, the crypto market, the global economy, and our own economy. You can read it less than five minutes every morning, and it's free. We also have a newsletter called Business Briefs. This is a newsletter for entrepreneurs, for founders, for innovators. This is a newsletter that focuses on the latest business trends. That way, if you're running a business, you can keep up with what's happening in the business world without having to spend hours of your time trying to keep up with all these business trends. Both of these newsletters are free. And if you want to join either one, I got the link for you down in the description below. But both of these newsletters are free. Now, how do we make money from these? Well, we sell advertisements in the newsletters. We have a clear sponsored spot. We go out and we have a business development team that's working to secure cool sponsorships, cool advertisements that we place within our newsletters. So again, we use the attention business model in order to make money because when we have people's attention reading our great content, because now in order for people to actually read our newsletters, we have to invest a lot of time and a lot of money and we have some of the smartest people doing this that are researching the top things that are happening breaking it down, understanding it, and then writing it in a way that's very easy to understand. That's why people love reading a newsletter. That's what gets people coming back to reading our newsletter. And that's why our audience is so engaged. So we are in the attention business. But now you can also be in a completely different business, which is how do you build a product? I used to be in the sock business. I used to sell socks. And that business model is how do you create a good product that people are willing to open up their wallets and pay you for? Can you create something, whether it's a product like socks, whether it's food, whether it's something else, pens, can you create something that's better than what's out there that people want, innovate on that, sell it and get people to open up their wallets and give it to you? Yes, yesterday I was at dinner with uh, my college roommate and we were talking about the same thing that he has this business idea. It's a food product that he wants to start selling. And he was asking me, what would I do if I wanted to go out and start selling this and start making money? And I said, the first thing that I would do is not go out and find a commercial kitchen. It would not be to go out and get all these licenses and all this stuff. I would just start selling it. Sell it to your friends, sell it to your family. And he got really concerned. Well, what about this? What about the labels? What about this tax? What about this? And I said, look, you will figure all of that out. But you got to figure out if people actually like it and want it first. Go get your friends to try it. I haven't even tried it. Go get your friends to try it. Go get your family to try it. See what they think. See if they're willing to pay for it. If you can get people to start paying you money for it, yeah, then go out, hire an attorney, get all the legal processes in order, but at least now you know there's demand for your product. You got to go out and just start doing it before you start spending money because the thing that stops so many people, let's just talk about YouTube because this is probably the most easiest example for anyone to understand. When anyone starts a YouTube channel, because I think a lot of people have had the idea to start a YouTube channel, their first question is, what equipment do I need? Which camera do I need? Which mic do I need? What lights do I need? What type of background do I need? And now we start thinking about the expenses and this hurdle to get started. And now it becomes a bigger game of, well, let me research cameras. Should I get a Sony? Should I get a Canon? Should I get something else? Which mic should I get? Should I get a lavalier? Should I get a mic like this? What about lights? Should I get ring lights? Should I get up lights? Should I get something else? And now you're playing the wrong game. You're focused on all the aesthetics instead of the actual product. When I started my YouTube channel, I made videos off of my cell phone in front of a white wall. 
Even today, I have a lot of videos that are recorded off of my cell phone with a $20 mic. Yeah, I have some fancy equipment now. This is a fancy camera. This is a fancy mic. I have a bunch of fancy stuff now, but I also have the simple stuff. If I'm traveling and I need to record something quickly, I do it off my phone with a $20 mic. If I want to do something quickly, I'll do it off of my phone. I have the expensive stuff now, but I started off with the simple stuff. What you got to do is you got to create the demand first. That's the way that I look at it. That demand comes before supply. I want to create demand for my product. I want to get the orders for my product before I go out and actually start spending money on building the product. And so now when it comes to earning money, how can you build something of value? How can you create something of value? Now, if you say, Jaspreet, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to go out and build a business. Okay, the process is still the same. How do you create value? within yourself. Because now if you want to earn more money and you don't want to build a business or start a side hustle, it's still the value that you provide is going to dictate how much money you earn. If you're working in a company, the more valuable you are, the more you're going to make. So now, how do you make yourself more valuable? What skills can you go out and learn? What certificates can you go out and get? What education can you go out and get? And now most people assume that this education means I got to go and get another degree, but that's not what that means. Education comes from experience and it comes from learning. There's a bunch of online classes you can take, a bunch of lessons that you can take and certificates you can take online and a lot of experiences that you can do. Can you go above and beyond now to go out and learn something, get experience to do something? If you want to work in the digital marketing space, can you learn how to run Facebook ads? Go out and just do Facebook ads for a local business. Find them and say you want to do it for free. Go out and learn SEO. Go out and do it for a business for free. You're not doing this now to earn. You're doing it to learn because if you do something to learn, well, then you can monetize what you learn, that value a lot better. But now you have to understand now, again, going back to tie it all together, why are you earning more money? Are you earning more money just so you can drive a better car? Or are you earning more money so you can have bigger investments? When I first learned, I'm telling this, I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as possible with you here. I'm not trying to be mean. When I first started learning about money, I was so angry because I had checked all the boxes. I studied hard in school. I was getting decent grades. I mean, it wasn't all A's, but I was getting pretty good grades. I was on track to be a doctor. Like I was doing all the right things. And then I learned about this thing called financial education. I started reading books about it and I started investing in real estate. This is before I uh, applied to medical school. I was very fortunate that this was after the 2008 crash, but I started investing in real estate. And that was the first time in my life that I had ever experienced any sort of this financial education through cash flow because now I bought a rental property. I made every mistake possible. So I'm not going to say that it just started putting money in my pocket, but it kind of did in the sense that I was making money and I knew that if I figured it out, I wouldn't have to continue working and dealing with the tenant and dealing with the property manager. And I was going to put some money, a few hundred dollars in my pocket every single month without me having to work. Now in the beginning, that's not how it worked because I screwed up everything that I did. But when I started to see that, it opened my eyes and my game completely changed. Instead of me working to be a doctor, to make money, to have nice things, I was working to buy rental properties so my rental properties could buy me nice things. And so now the game was completely different because now I started just trying to figure out how do I earn more money that way I can buy my rental properties. And that's when I tried everything possible because the name of the game was buying rental properties. And that's what I did for a long time. I was just doing things to make money to buy rental properties. Then after that, I started learning more about the value that I provided, the passion that I had, what were my interests, what change did I want to make in the world. But in the beginning, when I was really focusing on just the money, it was all about buying rental properties. That way I can create more cash flow. So now the question is, when you're working to earn more money, what are you doing with that money? Because if you're just taking that money and buying a bigger car, you're doing yourself and your future generations and your future wealth a huge disservice. Buy yourself the assets, let the assets buy you the car. I want you to have the nice things. I'm not saying don't buy it, but get the assets first. That way you can make yourself rich first. And the fifth habit that causes so many people to lose their future wealth is you don't have strategic patience. See, I don't just say patience outright because, yeah, you need some patience if you want to become successful. But you also want to be impatient because you want to put in the effort, the work, the risk, the time. That way you can get there quicker. But the reason why I say strategic patience is because when you kind of try to bypass the patience or the process, what ends up happening to a lot of people 
is you kind of fall into the traps of trying to find the get rich quick process, whether it's the next meme stock, the next crypto coin, the next hot business idea, where you can just throw your money into this thing and hope you can make a 10x return in six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months. And what ends up happening to 99% of people who end up doing that is you end up losing the money that went in. Yes, there's a small percentage of people that will end up making money from it. There's a small percentage of people that will hit it big, that will hit the jackpot. But the vast, vast majority of people that try to do that will lose everything. And this is where now, if you want to be one of the people that actually become successful, you have to be strategically patient and understand that real wealth is built over the long term. It's not built overnight. Anybody who you hear became an overnight success, they had to put in years of sacrifice, effort, risk, time, and a bunch of other sacrifices that they made in order to get there. And this is where now, if you want to go out and do it, you have to understand the value of the strategic strategic patience and understand that wealth is built over the long term and you got to love the journey and not just want the destination tomorrow. Yeah, you got to be impatient in the sense where now you're going to put in the work, you're going to put in the hustle, you're going to put in the time, you're going to put in the risk, you're going to put in the sacrifice. That way you can get the success sooner. But you also have to be strategic about it. That way you don't just go and blindly throw your money into dumb investments or into dumb ideas. That way you just get clouded by the emotion. When you get that emotional greed that you think that, oh my God, there's nothing that can go wrong. I'm going to make so much more money. That's where you got to take a step back, take a breather. And understand that the strategic patience is what's going to make you really wealthy. Once you start your wealth journey, the next question is going to be, how do I grow my wealth? How do I double my wealth? Because the faster that you can grow and double your wealth, the wealthier you're going to be. Because now you can just keep stacking and doubling and growing and compounding and building your wealth. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. And you don't have to quit your job and go and become an entrepreneur to do this. But there's a couple of ways that you can do it. One is you can go out and actually create something on your own. Or second is how do you now increase the amount of wealth that you're building and increase the speed at which your wealth is growing? Because it all comes down to the velocity of money. The faster you can grow your money, the faster you can grow your wealth. And this is where now understanding the difference between I'm going to throw my money into a savings account and get 1% a year on my money. Or I'm going to put my money into a business, into my own business idea, and get 100% return a year on my money. Putting your money into a business and getting 100% return is way riskier than throwing your money into a savings account and getting a 1% return on your money. And that's different than also throwing your money into a brand new car that's losing 20% a year on your money. But this is where now, between the savings and your business, you got to find the right velocity of money for you. And that's going to depend on your risk tolerance. It's going to depend on your education level. It's going to depend on your interest level. And it's going to depend on how much work you're willing to put in as well. Because in the middle, you have all of your other investments. You have your stock market investments. You have your real estate investments. But then even that have their own ranges. Are you going to be investing in individual companies and trying to find the next big company that you want to invest in? That's going to give you a higher velocity potential. Or do you want to just throw your money into ETFs and index funds? Lower return potential, but also less risk. And this is where now you have to understand how much risk are you willing to put in, how much time are you willing to put in, and understand that velocity of money. That way you can be realistic with the amount of wealth that you want to build and make sure that you're on the right path. If you say that you want to fly in private jets, you want to have a big, nice home, you want to drive in the Rolls Royce, and the way you're doing that is by putting $400 a month in your index fund. You're lying to yourself. How are you going to go from that index fund to the Rolls Royce? You got to look at the velocity of money and make sure that the velocity of money that you're using is aligned with the goals that you want to live. So now, if you want to go out and create something, well, that's possible. If you live in a first world country like the United States of America, you have more opportunity here than anywhere else. There's a lot of people that say otherwise. But the reality is you have more opportunities here than anywhere else in the world. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But you have more opportunities here. Now, the name of the game is how can you build something? How can you make money? And how can you create something beyond you? There's a book called Build to Sell that will teach you how to build a business that doesn't just rely on you. But now the question is, what do you actually do to go out and make money? What value, what service, or what product can you create 
that will get people to want to open up their wallet and give you their credit card number or give you a check or give you their cash. That way now you get the money and in exchange you get a product. And if you want to be able to scale that, you have to have something that you can create more of. Because now if your product is, I'm going to come in and I'm going to give you my consulting. I'm going to tell you what clothes to wear based off of my fashion consulting service. I'm going to tell you how to grow your business based off of my business consulting service. And it relies on you. You're going to have a very tough time scaling. That was a problem that I dealt with because in the beginning, I had an event planning company where I used to host parties. I used to work at weddings. And I started to make more money because I got good at what I was doing. I worked there for a number of years and then I started to charge more money for my services. But if I wasn't working, I wasn't getting paid. That scaling potential was so limited to just my income potential. But now if you can build something, let's say you sell mugs, you can hire people to build these mugs. You can create more of these things and focus on the marketing. Because if you and you're spending your time on the growth side of getting customers, of getting sales. Well, now you can scale this so much more because now you can hire people to continue building more. You don't have a supply limitation. Your limitation is on the demand side. That is where real success and wealth is built on the business side. If you can continue to grow the supply, you don't have the supply caps, and you spend your time focusing on the demand side meaning you spend your time on the growth, on the customers, on the marketing side. If that's a business that you can build, now you have a real business that you can sell, that you can step away from, that you can have another CEO run. Because now if you focus on building something that you can hire people or build systems to create the product for, and your job is to get more customers, well now, you can just keep working to get more customers. Now the game is how do you find the right marketing to get people to buy your stuff? But it requires a good product that people want to pay for that you can scale. And that's where real wealth is built in the entrepreneurial side. But now what if you don't want to build a business? What if you don't want to quit your job? That's okay. How can you now double your wealth? How can you create more wealth through something that you own without having to create it yourself? And this is where now it goes back to that velocity of money, where now the faster that you can grow your money, the faster you can invest your money, the wealthier that you're going to be. Let me start by showing you why the velocity of your money is so important here. If you can invest $500 a month and you do this for 40 years, the amount of wealth that you're going to build is going to depend on the velocity of your money, meaning what type of rate of return that you get, whether you get a 5% return annually, a 7% or a 10%. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to get this return every single year. I'm talking about the average. So some years you might lose money, some years you might make more money. But on average, if you get a 5 7 or 10% return, it's going to determine how wealthy you will become. And all three of these numbers are very accessible and achievable just depends on how much education and time and work you're willing to put into your passive investments. If you get a 5% annual return on your money, you're going to end up with about $750,000 with your $500 monthly investment. If you get a 7% annual return, you're talking about, about $1.2 million with your passive investments. And with the 10% annual return, now you're talking about $2.9 million dollars worth of wealth from your investments. That's a big difference between here and here, but it's both very accessible. It just depends on what is the velocity of your money and how fast you can grow your money. Let me break this down. The velocity of money that you're going to get is going to depend on how much risk you're willing to take on and how much work you're willing to put in. So the way we can break this down is now understanding the difference between being an active investor versus being a passive investor. And we can start by talking about this in the stock market because that's probably the most accessible and easy way to understand the way that it works. In the stock market, there's a couple of different ways that you can invest your money. You can invest your money by putting your money into individual companies like the Amazon stock. If you invest your money in Amazon, you are betting that Amazon is going to grow, make more money and become more valuable. Now, in order to do that and actually make money, you're going to have to put in the work to learn about the Amazon company, to study the Amazon financials, learn about their products, keep up with the company's doing, and make sure that the company is on track to continue growing. That way you continue to make more money. That's option one. That's more of an active investment. This is what Warren Buffett is doing. He's spending his time learning about companies, reading their financials, learning about who's running the companies. That's what his life revolves around. 
is to study companies, find companies that are undervalued, buy them and hold them for a long time. Option two is being a passive investor. This is where now instead of investing in a company like the Amazon company, you can invest in a fund that will give you exposure to a lot of companies. For example, there are ETFs, exchange traded funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500. One example of this is SPY SPY. SPY will give you exposure to the 500 largest companies in the stock market. So if you go out and invest in that one ticker symbol, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you an example. If you go out and you invest in the SPY ETF, you are going to own essentially 500 of the largest companies on the stock market. One of those companies is Amazon today. So now, you don't have to go out and learn about all 500 of those individual companies. You're just investing in that broad group. Now, your risk is much less because if one of the companies you invest in goes bankrupt, you have 499 other companies to balance it out. But that also means your upside is limited because if Amazon were to take over the world, well, yeah, you're going to benefit because it's in your ETF, it's in your fund, but it's going to be balanced up by some of the losers. So lower downside, lower upside. And you also get to save a lot of time because now you don't have to worry about so much Amazon and what they're doing, what their products are, who their executives are. You don't have to study their financials. So now as a passive investor, you don't have to worry so much about what is going on with the individual companies. You just find the right fund. And the way that you win is you create a system where every week, every two weeks or every month, you just continually keep buying more of those funds. It does not matter if the market's up. It does not matter if the market's down. You just keep buying more no matter what. That's how you build wealth over the long term is if you invest in funds that give you broad exposure to the markets and you just continue to ride the market because now if the American economy grows, your thinking is that these funds will grow as well. With the individual companies, it's different because now you have to find the right company and you have to own it for the long term and you have to make sure that this company continues to grow because now if you invest in the Amazon company and they go bankrupt, you just lost all of your investment. But if Amazon takes over the world, now you can see a huge return on your investment. So you can start to see that risk and reward. The more risk you take, the more rewards that you can get. If you want to be an investor in individual companies, you better be investing in your financial education of learning how do you analyze companies? How do you study financials? How do you learn what an income statement is? How do you study cash flow statements? How do you study balance sheets? How do you actually value the companies? This is a whole education in and of its own. And the more you learn, the better you're going to be able to do. Anybody can go out and invest in a company. And yeah, maybe you'll hit a couple of good companies here and there. But if you really want to increase your odds of good returns, and you want to increase the types of returns that you get, that's where you have to be investing in your education. On the passive side, it requires much less effort on your end. Now, you don't have to pick one or the other. I am both. I have a system where I am passively investing my money, and I also actively invest my money. I have a system where every week, for me, it's every Wednesday. I don't have a special sauce or science for why Wednesday. I just do Wednesday because I used to have it on Monday and Friday, but then sometimes the markets will be closed on Mondays and Fridays, so I just pick the middle of the week. But every Wednesday, I have cash that's pulled out of my checkings account and is automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. I have ETFs that give me exposure to value. I have ETFs that give me dividends. I have ETFs that invest into international companies. And I have ETFs that invest in innovation. So now, every Wednesday, I have cash pulled out of my account that's invested into these ETFs. There's a bunch of great platforms that specialize in this for you. I have the company who is an affiliate of mine, meaning if you use them, we will get compensated. Down in the description, if you want to learn more, but you can do your own research, find the right company for you. The company that I use is called M1 Finance. I like them just because, well, it's super simple. They specialize in this type of passive investing. So I'm a huge fan of them. But again, I want you to do your own research. If you want to learn more about M1 Finance, I got the link to my affiliate code down in the description if you want to check them out. But that happens for me on the passive side. On the active side of my investments, it's very different. Now I'm looking for individual companies. Now I'm looking for good companies that I believe are undervalued today that I believe have a lot of growth potential. Now this for me, I enjoy it because I like researching companies. I like being involved with companies. I'm an entrepreneur and I like studying companies. I like seeing what companies do. I like watching companies that are innovative. I like learning about who started a company. And before, like 10 years ago, it was a lot more difficult to 
understand who's actually running a company and their missions and their beliefs unless they wrote a book or unless they were interviewed somewhere on TV. Today, if you're looking at investing in a company, look at who is the CEO, look at who's running the company. You can go onto their Instagram page and see how passionate they are. If they're out there talking about what they're doing and if they're out there publicly doing things about the company, look at how innovative the company is. Are they creating a product that has lines around the door? Do they have something that's underserved that they're creating? Then do the financials make sense? Again, I like doing this, which is why I do it. You don't have to do this. This is something that I'm interested in, which is why I do that. So now my active investments have more risk. I have some investments that have lost me money. I have some investments that have made me a lot of money. My passive investments are much lower risk, where now I know that this is a long-term game. The way that you win as a passive investor is you invest for multiple decades. That is the way that you win. But now, different velocities of money. You could do the same thing with real estate. I am a real estate investor. I love investing in real estate because I love the cash flow that you can get from real estate. When I invest in real estate, I am actively involved. I'm going out and I'm looking for properties to purchase. When I buy a property, I bring in my contractor who will renovate the property because I like my properties to look very nice. So I'll buy a property that's beat up, that's distressed, that looks ugly, will completely renovate it, remodel it, and now it looks like a brand new home that somebody will want to come in and live in and use and then pay rent. And so now I'm involved up until we get the tenant involved because then I have a property manager who does everything after that. But it is an active investment because I'm actively looking for the investments to purchase. There are passive ways for you to invest in real estate as well. If you are interested in investing in real estate, but you don't want to put in the time or the effort, or you're not interested in dealing with tenants, well, then you can go to real estate investor conferences because there's always people that are looking for money. Always. And you can be one of the investors into these deals. These are called syndicate deals where now an investor, a developer, somebody is putting together a project. Maybe this person wants to go out and build or buy a hotel complex. Maybe they want to build or buy an apartment complex, but they need a certain amount of money. They need cash to go out and do it. And this is where now they're going to try to find people who have money, who want to give them the money in exchange for a piece of ownership in that deal. Now, of course, you have a little bit less risk because now your time is not going to be at stake. You're really just investing your money and you don't have to put in all the money, but there's a chance that the deal can go under. That's your risk. So now you have to trust the person, you give them your money, and then it's their job to take your money and purchase this asset, renovate it, rehab it, rent it out, generate cash flow, and maybe sell it for a profit or refinance it. That way you can get your money back you would probably be a silent investor in this case, but it's a way now for you to invest in real estate with less cash and to be completely passive. There's also platforms online that allow you to do this with smaller amounts of money, which are building systems. Again, is there risk? Of course, there's a risk that your investment platform will fail. There's a risk that the real estate investment deal will fail and you lose everything. That is a possibility. That's a possibility when you invest your money. But this is where now your due diligence and research is important. Now, if you want to see platforms that can do this, again, I have uh, an affiliate link with the companies that I have used in the past. You can check that out down in the description. But this is where you want to do your research. Understand that investing has risks. When you are a passive investor, you generally have less risk, but it doesn't mean that you have no risk. And so understanding the risk and understanding the returns that are potential and knowing now if the returns that you're trying to get are in alignment with the lifestyle that you want to live. Just go to Google and search a compound interest calculator and see how long will it take you to get to where you want to go based off how much money you're investing, based off of the type of returns that you're getting, and then see if it just makes sense. If you need a 4% return on your money to be able to live the life you want, well, then you don't have to be taking all the risks that you need, that you might think that you need in order to get that return, to get that wealth. If you need a 300% return on your money in order to go out and live the life that you want, well, you're going to need to start making more money. And this is where now you have to just make sure that your lifestyle is in alignment with what you want to achieve in life and just make sure the numbers make sense. And this is where the natural next question is, but just Preet, what about this economic situation that we're in right now? I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about a recession. I'm worried about inflation. I'm worried about interest rates. I'm worried about the Federal Reserve Bank. The reality is our economic system goes through cycles. It has happened in the past and it will continue to happen. We have seen a recession pretty much every decade for the last century. So now understanding that cycles happen and that doesn't change anything. 
if you are passively investing your money, the only thing you change when you go through a down cycle is maybe you invest more aggressively when markets are down because now you can buy more assets for the same amount of money. If you're actively investing while we're at the top of a cycle, when you're at peak prices, well, then maybe you just get more picky and look for better investments. The key is to constantly keep buying and building more assets, but also look for the opportunities when you come your way, because then when you go through a down cycle, there's more opportunities that are there because now you can come in and buy good assets at a discounted price because, yeah, the reality is there's a lot of concerns and issues in our economy right now, and a lot of people are predicting more pain ahead in our economy. We're starting to really see the Federal Reserve Bank get worried. We're seeing ex-Federal Reserve Bank officials stating that the banking crisis that we've been facing coupled with the higher interest rates are causing more pain in the economy, but the worries and the fears about our economy go beyond just the banking sector. The higher interest rates by the Federal Reserve Bank right now are clearly hurting the economy, but our job market is still way too strong. Now, let me clarify this because a strong job market is generally really good news for the economy. But when you're facing really high inflation, a strong job market can actually make the inflation problem more difficult to solve. Like if you take a look at the most recent inflation report, it said that CPI came in at 4.9% and core inflation was 5.5%. Now core inflation is what the Federal Reserve Bank likes to look at. That is the inflation number that the Fed has said since the pandemic started is their core inflation number that they like to look at. Core inflation is taking a look at the headline inflation, the broad inflation number, CPI, and then you take out what the Fed calls volatile numbers. So core inflation means you take CPI and you take out food and you take out energy. That's your core CPI, your core inflation. Now, what we've been seeing happen recently is core inflation is now higher than CPI. But what's even more interesting is to look at the drop in inflation, CPI versus core CPI. Because in June of 2022, CPI hit a peak of 9.1%. And back then, core inflation was at 5.9%, which means between June 2022, the peak inflation, and now CPI went from 9.1 to 4.9. But core inflation, which is what the Federal Reserve Bank says is their primary measure of real inflation, has come from 5.9 to 5.5%. Meaning, yes, inflation has fallen. But inflation still has a lot of ways down because the Federal Reserve Bank wants to bring inflation down to 2%. And in order to bring inflation down to 2%, they have to jack up interest rates. The reason why they have to jack up interest rates is because inflation is a byproduct of how much money is in our economic system. When there is more dollars in our economic system, more money in our system, people have the ability to spend more. Because when you have a bigger bank account or access to more money through the bank, you're going to go out and spend more money. We've seen this happen time and time again. Anytime people have more money, they spend more money. And now when you have a lot of people spending money, that means you have a lot of demand for the products that are out there. So demand's here, supply is here. Now all this demand then causes the price of things to rise. And so now when you have all this money out there, that increases demand causing the price of things to go up, which means now that for the Federal Reserve Bank to cool down inflation, they need to cool down demand. And how do they do that? By raising interest rates. When you raise interest rates, it makes borrowing money more expensive. So now when you want to go out and buy a home or you want to buy a car or you want to buy something with your credit card because you can't afford it, now you have to think twice because the cost of borrowing that money is more expensive. So that means people spend less money because if you're less likely to go out and shop, if you're less likely to go out and buy a home, if you're less likely to go out and buy a car, that reduces demand. And when demand goes down, that means now you have supply here, demand here, demand starts to come down. That means that the price of things don't rise as quickly. Because now when we see inflation fall, that doesn't mean that we're seeing the price of things fall on average. It means that the price of things are not growing as quickly as they were before. The Fed wants to see inflation at 2%. That means that they don't want to see the price of things fall. They want to see the price of things grow by 2%. But what we've been seeing happen is that the prices of things have been rising way faster than 2%, while wages have not been growing as fast. So we've been seeing the price of things so grow so quickly, while wages have been growing less quickly. And now the Fed doesn't want to see the price of things fall. They want to see the price of things start growing less quickly, which means if your income is not rising as fast as inflation, you're effectively becoming poorer because your salary and your income has less buying power. 
And this is the difficulty that the Federal Reserve Bank is seeing is that it is difficult to bring inflation down. And at the same time, we're also seeing the higher interest rates cause pain in the economy. The higher interest rates caused multiple banks to collapse. The higher interest rates have forced other businesses to fail. The higher interest rates have led to a lot of layoffs. But inflation still is extremely high. And so now we're starting to see more and more fear and worry on the Federal Reserve Bank side because on one hand, they want to bring inflation down. On the other hand, they don't want to tip the United States into a major recession, especially with 2024 being an election year. So this is where now the Federal Reserve Bank is going to have to balance these two things. Because if they pause or start cutting interest rates, that could make the inflation problem worse, which hurts the economy. But then if they keep staying aggressive with interest rates, that's going to also hurt the economy. And now the question is, what are they going to prioritize? Are they going to prioritize bringing inflation down? Or are they going to prioritize a slowing economy? Because previously, the Federal Reserve Bank has said that inflation is their primary concern and the only thing that they're worried about, they're not worried about the economy. Today, we still have a very strong job market, but inflation is high. But now the Fed is saying, well, we're worried about the economy a little bit, so we might have to kind of ease the gas on inflation. And the reason why the job market is such a big factor here is because, well, the Federal Reserve Bank has made it very clear that one of the byproducts of bringing inflation down is a looser job market. Because the Fed can't say outright that they want more layoffs because that would just cause a lot of controversy. Instead, what they say is that the job market is too tight and we need to see a looser job market. And what that means is we need less people to have jobs. Right now, the unemployment rate is at around 3.4%, which is the lowest level that we have seen in about five decades. Now, of course, this isn't always super accurate information. Unemployment numbers can be fudged and kind of how they calculate unemployment. But the main thing here is understanding that people have jobs. It might not be the jobs that people want. It might not be the pay that people want, but people have the ability to get jobs. And based off of that data, the Federal Reserve Bank is saying, well, we have a lot of people with jobs. And so we have or should have the ability to bring interest rates higher to cool inflation down. And the problem is, that in order to bring inflation down, we need to cool down demand. If we want to cool down demand, people need less ability to spend. If people need less ability to spend, that means less people had to have jobs. And if less people have to have jobs, that means more pain in the economy. And this is the tough situation where the Federal Reserve Bank has been working to ramp up interest rates, but we haven't seen the full effect of the higher interest rates yet. And the Federal Reserve Bank still hasn't been able to really bring inflation down to where we need it to be. This is that dilemma that the Federal Reserve Bank is facing right now because the Federal Reserve Bank wants to cool the job market. They want to cool down inflation, but they also don't want to break the economy. Not to mention, one of the most influential numbers on the CPI, inflation numbers, is the housing market because they indirectly look at the housing market and this makes up almost half. I think it's about 44% of the total CPI number of housing-related expenses. And as interest rates fluctuate, that has an impact on home prices. Every time we see mortgage rates drop a little bit, we see a huge surge in demand of people wanting to go out and buy homes. And so every time we see mortgage rates drop, people go out and buy homes, people go out and buy homes, that means there's more demand to buy homes, that pushes home prices higher. When home prices go higher, well, that affects CPI and the inflation numbers, which gives the Fed more fuel to continue raising interest rates, which creates a unique dilemma for the housing market because now everyone's worried about what does this mean for the housing market and where is the housing market going to go? Right now, the housing market is officially booming again, but it might be hitting a breaking point. Let me read you this article from May 5th on Yahoo Finance. It says that the home price rebound could complicate the Fed's effort to tame inflation. And the reason why this matters, let me just read it to you, is because housing costs contribute to 44% in the overall goods and service bucket used to calculate the CPI consumer price index, which is the main gauge for inflation. Meaning, the housing market makes up a huge chunk of inflation, and if the housing market continues to be so strong, that's continue to put upward pressure on inflation, which could pressure the Fed to want to cool down the housing market. But at the same time, what's really interesting is we're starting to see mortgage applications drop 
even when mortgage rates drop. This is a big flip from the trends that we have been seeing because if we go back to February of 2023, when interest rates first started to drop, it gave buyers some breathing room and then we saw prices of homes shoot up very quickly because when mortgage rates dropped, everybody wanted to go out and buy a home and this increase in demand to buy a home caused home prices to rise because of the mortgage rates dropping. And that was why Bloomberg even put out a piece saying that lower mortgage rates will not make your home more affordable. The reason being that anytime you see lower mortgage rates, you might be able to save some money on the mortgage side on your monthly payment, but you're going to have to pay more money to buy the home because everybody's trying to buy a home when mortgage rates fall. That was the environment for the housing market up until the early part of May, because in the early part of May, when First Republic collapsed, we saw mortgage rates fall and we also saw mortgage applications not rise. So starting in May 2023, we saw for the first time this discrepancy between mortgage rates and an increase in mortgage applications where we saw mortgage rates fall after First Republic collapsed and when mortgage rates fell, we didn't see a drastic rise in mortgage applications. Why? Well, there's three potential reasons for this. Number one is people don't want to buy a home. Number two is people can't afford to buy a home. And number three, is regulations. Now, starting with number one of people wanting to buy a home, I think people who want to buy a home want to buy a home. I don't think everybody who wants to buy a home has already bought a home. So I don't think it's number one. Number two, which is people can't afford to buy homes, is plausible because now with the high inflation that we have been facing for the last number of years, many people are starting to feel priced out, not just because home prices have risen, but because the cost of everything has gone up. You have to pay more money for your groceries. You have to pay more money to go on a vacation. You have to pay more money to really just survive. And so now when you want to go out and buy a home, not only is the home price much higher, but the mortgage rates are also high. And because the home prices are higher, your insurance payments are higher. And because the home price is higher, your property taxes are also higher. So now people are kind of looking at their state of their finances and they're saying, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't upgrade to buy a home right now. Maybe we should just kind of stay where we are right now. Maybe we shouldn't go out and try to do that with a new home because the cost of everything is just so expensive. So let's hold off for a little while until we can save up some more money, have a bigger down payment, and have some extra financial breathing room. And then we have the third reason, which are regulations. As of May 1st, 2023, there have been new regulations in the mortgage market, which make it more expensive for you to buy a home if you have a good credit score. And it also makes it a little bit cheaper for you to go out and get a mortgage if you have a bad credit score. So there was a new program that was put into place. I already made a video kind of explaining this, but I'll just kind of highlight it here. A new program put into place, which essentially said that if you have a great credit score over 740, now the fees you'll pay to get a mortgage backed by the government is going to be higher. So you're going to have to pay more fees in order to get a mortgage versus if you had a bad credit score. Well, now if you had a bad credit score, now you actually get a break on your payments and fees. So it's a little bit easier for you to get a home. This created a lot of controversy because the question is, who are you incentivizing? Are you incentivizing people who shouldn't buy a home to go out and buy a home? Are you incentivizing people who had bad credit scores to go out and buy a home? And at the expense of hurting people who have been working to build up the credit scores, have the right payments, do the right things to now have to pay more money to go out and buy a home. So that could also be a part of it. But what we know for sure is that mortgage rates play an effect on demand for homes. We have seen this time and time again, where people will pay more attention to what their monthly payments are than to the actual price of the home. Now, what we're starting to see happen is that even lower mortgage rates are not creating that intense demand to go and buy a home the way that it did six months ago or even four months ago. Now, what are the actual reasons for this? Is it regulations? Is it the high inflation? Is it a slowdown in the economy? We don't know the exact data or reason why, but we're starting to see this start of effect and this change where now even lower mortgage rates are not creating that huge surge in demand for homes the way that it did before. But then the next factor we have to understand is how the housing market is lagging data. Most of the data that we get is behind. It might be behind a week. It might be behind a month. It might be behind two months. And so now when the Federal Reserve Bank is working to analyze this data, the question is, when they make their interest rate decisions, are they looking at the data that we have? Are they projecting where the data is in the future? 
are they looking at previous data? Because previously, what the Federal Reserve Bank has said is that they're going to look at the data that is present to us right now. And yes, that data that's present to us right now is lagging data, but based off of the data that they have, that was what they used to determine what they wanted to do with interest rates. Now, they're saying that they want to look at where they believe the data is going to be going. And so that will then impact their interest rate decisions. The reason why this matters is because if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, that's going to put higher pressure on the mortgage market. If they continue to raise interest rates and you see more pressure on the mortgage market for higher mortgage rates, well, that will continue to hurt demand. And so home prices, like any other asset class, are determined by supply and demand. When you have more people that want to buy a home, that want to sell a home, that pushes home prices higher. When you have more people that want to sell a home than buy a home, that pulls home prices lower. And a big driving factor for demand in the mortgage market are mortgage rates. So this is where now understanding what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing, understanding the factors that they're looking at, and understanding what's going on with inflation, the housing market, the economy is so important for you as an investor. That way you can make smart financial decisions today will help guide you. That way you can find the right opportunities not get caught up into the weeds of the emotions of what's happening because a lot of the traditional media is out there just to sell clicks and emotions. But understand that if we do see a slowdown, that creates opportunity. And what you need to be doing is make sure you're preparing. That means you have some cash put aside to protect you. That means you have an income there that's stable. That means you have money to capitalize on opportunities that might come your way. That way, if you do see more opportunities, you're not blindsided by it. And you have the ability to go out and actually capitalize on it because the reality is 10 years from now, one decade from now, we're going to see a whole new wave of millionaires because people will be able to capitalize on what happens over the next few years of this economic craziness. And the question is, are you going to be one of the people that capitalizes on it or are you going to be one of the people that misses the opportunity or gets angry because of it? Unlike what the majority of people say, you will not become wealthy by just avoiding Starbucks and you will not become wealthy by just simply earning a six-figure salary. Let me show you. See, everybody wants to become rich, but only a fraction of those people who want to become rich ever will achieve any sort of financial freedom. The question is, why? Is it because